the great companion Abu Dharr radiyallahu anhu qal awsani hibbi bi khamsin ay habibi bi khamsin an arham al masakin wa ujalisahum wa an anzura ila man huwa tahti wa la anzura ila man huwa fawqi wa an asil al rahim wa in adbarat وأن أقول الحق أو أقول بالحق وإن كان مرا وأن أقول لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله وفي رواية فإنهن من كنز تحت العرش. The great companion Abu Dhar رضي الله عنه says, my beloved gave me an advice. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم that consists of five items. First one, an ujalis al masakin, an arham al masakin wa ujalisahum, to have mercy towards the weak and the poor, and to sit with them, spend time with them. Wa an anzura ila man huwa tahti, wa la anzura ila man huwa fawqi, to focus more, to look at those who have less than I have, and not to focus on those who possess more than I do. وَأَنْ أَصِلَ الرَّحِمَ وَإِنْ أَدْبَرَتْ That I connect those who are related to me, even if they turn away from me. وَأَنْ أَقُولَ بِالْحَقِّ وَإِنْ كَانَ مُرَّ And to speak the truth, even when it's bitter. وَأَنْ أَقُولَ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ And to say, there is no might, there is no power except with Allah or from Allah. In another version of this narration, he says, because these are from a treasure, these items are from a treasure that is under, underneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, sometimes we try to look at things, we search for big things, huge things, but we don't realize sometimes what really makes a difference are the things that we underestimate, the things that seem to be simple to us. And sometimes the biggest impact on our faith, the things that help us grow spiritually in our faith, the most are the things that we tend to undermine and look down upon. So let's unpack these five things and see how we can implement them in our lives. This is a prophetic advice and guidance. The Prophet ﷺ said, to have mercy towards the poor and the weak and to sit with them, mix with them, go and see them for yourself. And we have fallen, in these times, we have fallen into sending donations from overseas through organizations and charities, which is not necessarily a bad thing, it's actually a great thing because there are people who don't even think about those who are less fortunate. So it's a great thing, but there is something else other than just donating. The fact that you go and see for yourself how the conditions of these people, their struggles, their pain, their humility, which we tend to forget in these times because we are bombarded with a lot of propaganda, a lot of influence through social media and even through the, the, the whole machine of, of society and its culture that tends to make us focus on the rich. You know, when you are checking your social media, a lot of the videos and the ads that are, that are brought up, that you are faced with, you'll find it that it's about people who are rich or people who made some kind of fortune. And it captivates us. They tell you how they made a fortune, how they made a million in a year. And how they started getting more income. And they, try, and they claim to share their secrets with you. So you start chasing these people and see how much or how they have made such huge amounts of wealth. Because you want to be like that. That's not necessarily bad. But we probably need to ask ourselves, where is this desire coming from? Because having wealth with which you preserve your dignity and you don't put yourself down before others is a great thing. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, 
the great Tabi'i, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he was a rich person. And sometimes he was blamed for the kind of business that he used to do. And Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak used to sponsor, he actually sponsored a few of the great personalities in At-Tabi'een. He said to them, don't worry about your, about earning a living, it's on me. Just stay with knowledge, spread knowledge, and teach the people, and I will take care of your expenses. So when a person says to him, why are you doing all, you talk about zuhud and about abstaining from the pleasures of this life, but you are just engaging in so much business and you bring in caravans and you're, you're buying and selling. And he said to him, لَوْلَا هَذَا الْمَالِ لَتَمَنْدَلَ بِنَ النَّاسِ أَوْ لَتَمَنْدَلَ بِنَ الْلِئَامُ مِنَ النَّاسِ He said, had it not been for this wealth, we would have been used as mobs, as rugs by others who have ill intentions. I protect my dignity, my honor and myself from being abused by those who use the poor and abuse them and bully them, which is the norm these days, although it's done in a more in, a, in subtle ways and masked ways today. But that's what capitalism is about. You are worth what you possess. If you have less, you are, your worth is less. And try to, for example, apply, try to rent a property and you see how the rich and those who have the wealth and have the property, how they screen everything about your life and they get into the very private aspects of your life just why? Because they can afford it. Because you need them. So he said, I protect my dignity from those abusive bullies out there with the money. So there's nothing wrong with possessing more money. But the question is, where is this desire coming from? Is it, I want to live a life of luxury. I want to live, you know, the, the American dream. I want to enjoy myself. I want to go on vacation every other month and so on. Is that the reason for it? I want to drive the, the best cars, the most expensive cars, and I want everyone to see what kind, of, what kind of car I'm driving. If this is the place that this desire is coming from, then there's a problem. So that's why the Prophet He's balancing this out, this desire for us to look at people who possess more, thinking that we're going to learn from their secrets and hoping that we will be like them and most of them are abusing this desire of ours in order to pull your money towards them and they give you a false promise that they are going to share the secrets that will make you rich. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, don't, don't let this be your focus. But also look at the people who have less. People who have less. Go and sit with them. Go and mix with them. Their humility is contagious. And it is going to humble you. It's going to bring you back to where you should be. It's going to remind you of the reality of this life. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about humans, the natural tendency in humans, That man, humans, when they become rich, when they have resources, they tend to become arrogant and feel that they are self-sufficient and that they have made the wealth, the wealth by themselves out of their own merit and that they are better than others. That's the human weakness. So we need to fight against this by, by mixing with the poor, checking them out. So we could learn from their humility because life has humbled them sometimes by force. And there's a lesson for us to learn from, from that. So this is something that is good for us, good for our hearts, and good for our children if we do that. And the second point, the second advice, clarifies this because it says, and to look at the people who have less than what you have, and not to be completely consumed and focused with the people who have more. Because again, as you are trying to learn the skills of the rich, and their formula for getting rich overnight, you tend also to catch their arrogance 
and their attachment to this worldly life in a way that cuts you off from connection to Allah, from keeping in mind that the real life is in the hereafter. So when you focus and look at the people who have less than you, you tend to appreciate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Because we all live in a lot of blessings. But the thing is, we automatically take them for granted. And we don't count them. And we look at the people who have more, and we see ourselves as deprived, as disadvantaged. Why Allah give these people all these resources? They didn't give me. Where If you were to neutrally check yourself, you would see billions and billions and countless blessings that you are enjoying. And you only wake up to them when you lose one of them. Health is a typical example. You wake up one day and your health is compromised. You realize that you were so wealthy with this health, with optimal health, but you were not appreciative of it. But now you start to feel the loss. Now you start to see and appreciate the value of it. Why? Because the fact that it was taken away from you woke, woke you up. It shook you. You started to see the reality that you were hiding or you were pushing away from, you, from yourself because you were focused on the people who have more than you have. There are people who have more than you have, maybe in terms of finances or other things, but you have more than they have in your own ways as well. But we are just so fixated on wealth and possessions, material possessions, to the point that we don't appreciate other gifts. Sometimes the, the provision from Allah, the blessings from Allah, come in the form of peace of mind, good health, beautiful children, a wonderful spouse, a rich heritage. Sometimes it just comes with personal traits, with social connections. Sometimes it comes with knowledge and understanding. Sometimes it comes with personal traits, just personal traits. That's a form of wealth and richness. But we are programmed away from appreciating this. Why? Because we're singing single-handedly focused on material wealth. And by doing that, the masses are being exploited and abused to spend their wealth in a way that makes the wealth poor towards the rich. They get richer. So the Prophet is saying, look at those who have less than you. So you tend to appreciate what you already have. This is medication for the heart. <clears throat> and that I connect to my relation, to those who are related to me by, by blood. Your parents, your siblings, your uncles, aunts, cousins, and so on and so forth. Connect to them. Give them their rights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us into this world through some kind of lineage, through some kind of ancestry, through family, through the parents. And he made genuine connection, connections that are physical. Yes, through our genes, we are connected to our cousins, to our siblings. We share something with them. And that's still true. And this imposes some kind of right towards these people. Because we share the same origin with them. So they have more rights than others. And the Prophet ﷺ said, الْأَقْرَبُونَ أَوْلَى بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Those who are connected to you, those who are related to you by blood, they have more right upon you than a stranger. Although both might be in need. Why? Because there is the right of the poor upon the rich to help them and support them. And there's also the right of those who are connected to you through blood. even if they turn away from you. And many of us have this attitude that I'll give when they give me. I'll be kind when they are kind. Everyone can do that. The real goodness in your heart shows when people turn away from you, when people don't treat you well, but you still fulfill the obligation on your side, regardless of them failing to, fail, uh, to, to fulfill their side. That's true nobility. And it doesn't mean you make yourself uh, some sort of an object of their abuse. It doesn't mean that. You can do that with dignity. Because when you come from a position of truth, you have this 
You have this groundedness in reality that gives you so much leverage and power. And that leads us to the <coughs> following piece of advice. And to speak the truth even when it's bitter, when it's not sweet, when it's inconvenient. And that means, and we spoke about this previously, you have to ground yourself in the truth. You have to live for the truth, in truth, and for the truth. That's how we have, to, that's the only option to live, because anything other than that, it means we are, we, have, we, have, we are misaligned with the truth. And the definition of this is lying and deception. So say, speak the truth. That doesn't mean you don't have wisdom. Some people go and speak the truth when it brings about more destruction. They say it inappropriately, in the wrong time. No, when you take a text from the Quran or from the Prophet Wasallam, it applies within an ecosystem of etiquettes and other texts. You'll find sometimes someone starts practicing, they know something true. They go and create a problem with their parents, with their siblings, with their boss, with their friends, with their spouse. And say, I'm just saying the truth, even when it's bitter. No, that's lack of wisdom. Use common sense. Use good judgment. But speak the truth. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَ Remind when the reminder is likely to benefit. There is a situation for everything. For every situation, there, there are proper words to be said and a proper manner to convey these words through. All of this is important. But make sure that if you can't speak the truth or the situation does not allow for speaking the truth or it's likely to create more damage, then at least don't lie. At least don't lie. And the final one, وَأَنْ أَقُولَ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ There's no might, there's no power except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is about dhikr. This is about remembering Allah. And when we do dhikr, we are engaging with the bigger truths of life. There is something inside of us, in our human nature, right at the center of our human nature, that craves the truth, that feeds off of the truth, that improves and develops with the truth, that is empowered with the truth. We have this thirst for the truth and it quenches our thirst. And it empowers us and it grounds us and it makes our existence meaningful. We have this need for the truth. So when we engage in dhikr, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, we are engaging with the most important truths about existence. That's the existence of Allah, His qualities, His names, His attributes. We are allowing these truths to come into our life, to start to shape us within. And that's a profound exercise. These are not just words. Dhikr is not just words, it's a very profound exercise. It's an engagement, it's a holistic engagement that gets every part of us working. And when you do more dhikr, it's not like you have just had more numbers in your records. No, it changes you. It changes who you are. But again, we don't give ourselves the chance to grow with that. We don't have the patience and the perseverance, the persistence to keep doing that so that the results start showing in our lives. But we just get excited, we do it for a couple of days, and then we go back into business as usual. So we don't build momentum. So dhikr is some sort of a travel. You're traveling to another world. You're traveling to the world of truth that cannot be captured with your eyes. Something you cannot touch with your hands. There's a bigger truth, but your heart can connect to it. And it's more real than what you see and what you hear. It's just we are not using our heart as the main faculty. Our heart has a real experience with the world of the unseen, and it, and it craves that. But we're not giving it that. We're so focused on our immediate reality. 
What is going on? The financial situation of the country. How to make more money. And how to buy this. How to buy that. How to get this. How to take this trip. How to buy that house. We're so focused on the material part of our existence, which we should not ignore. But it has devoured the totality of our lives. So these are five pieces from advice of advice from the Prophet ﷺ that have come from under the throne of Allah, just underneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shows their, their, their status and their importance and their power. Their power. There's nothing about the advice of the Prophet ﷺ that is lip service, that is mere words. These are so transformative, but we need to engage with them fully. So, if we look at these pieces of advice, and again, the moment you've heard those, a level of obligation has fallen upon you. A level of obligation has fallen upon you. These, these are prophetic advice, and you are meant to fulfill them. Prophet ﷺ has this authority. His words have this authority. And these things, the beautiful thing, the beautiful thing about Islam and about Islamic instructions, obligations, prohibitions, is that they are not arbitrary in the sense they're not just random. Allah just wants to put a burden on us, so just wants to test us. Although this is true, there is an element of test. But we are tested through the things that are good for us. Everything in Islam has practical benefit, whether we figure that out or we don't. But we know Allah is Al-Alim and Al-Hakim. Allah is the all-knowing and, and wise. He's profoundly wise, perfectly wise. So wisdom entails that there is nothing that Allah does randomly. So everything in Islam that we are invited to is good. In a practical sense. Everything that is prohibited in Islam is detrimental. In a practical sense. There is no separation between how Allah created the world and the system He sent to us to navigate this world. It's the same. So let's hold on to this advice and try at least to implement whatever we can. At least today, next week. Try to fulfill each one of them. Search for a poor person. Even if you connect with them online. Even if you, if you travel overseas, just go ahead and see. Even in this society, there are people who are poor. There are people who can't afford to even have accommodation or even have food for the day. Go and search for them. Speak with some, some charity. Tell them, I want to I wanna go with my kids. I want to help the poor. I want to be kind to them, even if it's for once. Sit with them, speak with them, see what their struggles are. That softens your heart, it takes it away from its complete consumption with this life and, 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 and its pleasures. And look for those relatives that you have not spoken to in a while. Go and connect with them, give them a phone call, go and visit them. Send them a gift with the intention to please Allah and obey the Prophet and keep the remembrance of Allah. Today, at least just for today, say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله as many times as possible. Simple. Simple. Let it, let it start changing and purifying your heart. Allahumma khfir al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat wal-muslimina wal-muslimat al-ahya'i minhum wal-amwat. Allahumma khfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina. Thabbit aqdamana wa nsurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Allahumma khfir lana wa liwalidina. ولمن لهم حق علينا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أبرم لهذه الأمة أمر رشد يعز فيه أهل رعاتك ويهدى فيه أهل معصيتك ويعمل فيه بكتابك وسنة نبيك صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم كن للمستضعفين من المؤمنين في كل مكان اللهم حق دماءهم صن أعراضهم واحفظ عليهم دينهم وإيمانهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين إن شاء الله next Friday the second khutbah will be at 2.15 and we will make the khutbah shorter as well. So 2.15 bi-idhnillah. 2.15 the khutbah will start. Jazakallah khair. <coughs>